Hi, and welcome to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. I release content twice a week on a Wednesday and a Sunday. And you can also watch my old playlist because I've covered quite a lot of crimes by now. As ever, thanks for tuning in. Blows my mind that you do. I love it. Thank you. I love my growing family on YouTube and I'm loving all the comments. And today I actually went through comments and looked at some of the crimes that you wanted covered. And I'm going to cover one that you suggested, which is David Burney and Catherine Harrison, otherwise known as David and Catherine Burney. So this is a really horrific case. These two were really dangerous serial killers. And I'm going to try to talk through how I think they were formed and forged. And wow, when I think about female serial killers, the only ones that come close to Catherine Burney are Rose West and Myra Hindley. Those are probably the two that remind me most of her. But there is something even more terrifying when you delve into this woman. You just see that there's something pretty distinct about her nature and hopefully it will reveal itself as I talk through what happens. So how did David and Catherine meet? Well, they were brought up in pretty much the same location. So really early on, they were playing with other kids in the same area. However, one of the things that was noted by kids in the neighborhood was that David Burney was constantly filthy. He came from a really, really chaotic home and also Catherine had a really awful situation happen to her when she was two years old her mother gave birth and she died during giving birth and then her brother died two days later at this point it's a real problem because she has a father who just is unable to cope and she kind of gets shipped from pillar to post, ends up with grandparents and then back with dad and this goes on for some time. So what we could say is even though they meet as children, their lives are incredibly chaotic, but they have this similarity. And I think when you feel that your life is different to the people that you hang around with, then the consequence of that can be pretty troubling. And if you find a similar soul, then it can be very magnetic. David himself was the eldest of many siblings in his household. It was really chaotic. And I mean chaotic, as you would imagine that word is described. So people who knew them said that the kids were filthy, there was food all over the home. Basically, his mother was a really serious alcoholic. Now, if you look through a lot of records, there is also a suggestion that David Burney's father was an alcoholic. This isn't true. He actually worked incredibly long hours. He tried his best to provide for the children, but he worked away a lot. So we essentially have a very chaotic drunk mother who's had lots of children and can't take care of them at all. But the father tries to be in their life, but there isn't that stability. And whenever neighbours describe what the children look like, they were told they were filthy, dirty, unkempt. They're the kind of kids that social services would take away from families, and rightfully so. Now, another thing that we see early on in David Burney's life is that his mother, essentially, because he's the eldest child, and we're not talking elder like 16, 17, we're talking six years of age, she believes it's his job to look out for the younger children. And in fact, not just his job, if he fails to do that, she beats him. And she beats him with a stick, she beats him with a broom handle, she is very, very violent. As I said, she's totally inebriated a lot of the time, and therefore there is no consistency, no stability, and no structure in place. And we can clearly know at this point there's gonna be massive attachment issues, aren't there? lots of siblings around, you're incapable of a child of actually being able to look after your brothers and sisters, but if you don't, you get beaten. And she would beat David for anything. So if he didn't get to the baby quickly enough as it started to grumble, she would beat him. Anything that meant she had to be aware of the children around her caused her this kind of violent reaction. So it was a really crappy place to grow up, without a doubt. I'm not taking away one minute the fact that David Burney's childhood really wasn't happy. All of him and his siblings were taken into care. They were separated. And one of the people that worked with him at school, so one of his kind of teachers, 
noticed that he had real psychological disturbances. He would draw really awful pictures. They would be graphic pictures. And she'd say that he would like scratch them and screw them up. And she said there was just this like anger in him that she could see from a really early age. There was just this complete anger. You know, think about it. Eight years of age, he's committing crimes. Now, as I've mentioned, Catherine Harrison has been shipped from pillar to post. Harold, her father, didn't want to take care of her because he didn't feel he had the resources. She shipped to her grandparents in South Africa. And then there's custody battles and it's really, really confusing for her. And basically, when she's 10 years old, she arrives back in Perth. And that's when David Burney and Catherine Harrison kind of start to hang out together. I mean, they're basically inseparable by the time that she is 12 and he is 14. Her life has been tragic. I'm not gonna take that away from her because at the end of the day, she didn't really have any roots. She wasn't very well taken care of. And by the time she returned to Perth, her social skills were not great. She was incredibly lonely. She was known to be ostracized from the children. And I guess part of that is to do with the fact that when you look back in time, I don't know, it wasn't very nice in the past if you came from a family who'd had challenges. You know, illegitimate children were always judged quite harshly. If you came from a poor home, a lot of the time you would be judged quite harshly. If you weren't taken care of by your parents, you'd be judged quite harshly. So she is very lonely and she's described actually by people as quite a desperate child. So at this moment in time, we can all take a moment and say, David Burney and Catherine Harrison, we should feel sorry for them. They had been failed. There is no doubt whatsoever, no child should grow up in filth, no child should suffer abuse, and actually no child should be shipped from pillar to post. It's really unhelpful for them. At 12 years of age, David Burney and Catherine get together. So she's 12, he's 14. Her father already knew that David Burney was bad news. He actually begged her not to have a relationship with her. But there was this clear relational experience between them. You know, think about meeting somebody that just gets you. You have a life story that other people find challenging to compute. Understandably, if they haven't had those experiences, how will they know what it's like to feel wretched, lonely, abused, abandoned? How will they connect? But if you meet an individual who does have that similar story, then automatically you're drawn to them because that bit within you that's seeking that kind of solace, well, that's something that for most of us is alluring. So at this point, they've got together and pretty much from the get-go, we know that David from the age of eight, yes, eight, is involved in crime. He's actually been taken by the police because of this. So eight years old, he's in the system. And at 12 and 14, they basically go on criminal rampages. They're really bad at it. I have to say they improve their methods as time goes on, but they are really bad at it. They're constantly getting caught. It's basically a lethal combination. They start having sex when she's 14, and one of the things that you'll recognize about David Burney is pretty much from the start. He is a sexual deviant, and he is a sexual addict. I say addict in inverted commas because I don't necessarily believe in sex addiction, more that he had a high appetite that needed to be satiated, so to speak. What's strange about David Burney and Catherine Harrison is that life tried to throw them a rope. It really did. You know, in some cases you look and you're like, wow, I can kind of see how this story unfolds. I can kind of connect with how you could end up doing dire things to people. But in this case, they both had ropes of hope thrown to them. So at 15 years of age, he actually ends up going to work at a stables. He's really small. So the guy who runs them notices this and thinks he can make a jockey of him. So he goes to his mother's house and talks to David Burney and his mother. And he notices one of the things that is really shocking is firstly the state of the accommodation, but also there are just cigarette ends everywhere. Very heavy smokers in the house. And he actually makes a point of saying to David Burney, you can't smoke as a jockey. And he says, no, it's my parents. My parents who smoke like that. But this is incredible. 
You know, this kid who's in the criminal justice system, who's having loads and loads of problems in his life, this man has noticed that there is a potential, not just that he can work for him at the stables, but he could have a career as a jockey. I mean, that's an unusual stroke of luck, right? And his trainer is so wishing to help him because he can see that his living situation is totally untenable when it comes to being somebody trained as a jockey, that he finds him a landlady, he finds him accommodation. Within a few weeks of that 15 year old boy moving in to his landlady's, she calls him and says that he tried to rape her. Basically, she's in bed and David Burney climbs into bed with her and tries to rape her. That's a few weeks into that situation. I mean, it's unbelievable. So this thread of hope has been absolutely thrown to him, but his impulse control is really low. And I wanna note that at this point, because of some of the excuses that I think have been used in the past to excuse some of his behaviors. Because right now, right at the beginning of his life, he's had a horrible time, but he has very low impulse control, doesn't he? From eight years of age, he's stealing. He could have been stealing for food. After all, his living situation was pretty dire. But this thread of opportunity was just given to him. And what does he do? He just tries raping his landlady. That is a dangerous human being right there. By the time he's 20 years old, he has a huge criminal record. He's constantly breaking and entering, and he's constantly involved in the system. At this point, him and Catherine have been together quite a few years. She has also been involved in these crimes. But for some reason, that petite woman, because she obviously didn't fit what they considered the prototype of a criminal, she manages to escape getting any prison sentences, but then on one particular occasion, she does get sentenced to six months in prison and that changes everything for her. That's her thread of hope because she has six months of pretty intensive counseling and she realizes that she has this really unhealthy codependency on David and she's actually able to break free of that relationship. Not just does she break free, she gets a job as a housemaid and then her employer's son, he marries her at 21. And you know, she has a nice life. To all intents and purposes, her life has gone from being this lonely, disheveled, abandoned child to actually landing on her feet. She's met her potential life partner and she actually has six children with him, six children. And people say that from the outside, they seemed very happy. In fact, her own ex-husband talks about the fact that as far as he was concerned, they were in a happy relationship, that they had a good relationship. I will say that one of their children, sadly, was actually ran over and killed in front of Catherine. And psychiatrists say that this was certainly, as far as they're concerned, a point of trigger. I mean, I can't imagine what it would be like to lose a child, to see a child run over in front of you and die as a parent, that is not only the worst image one can conjure, but to manage to even survive that would be something that I think is incredibly challenging. Equally, David Burney gets married. He gets married to a woman called Kerry at 21. They actually got married after one month, again. Okay? pretty poor impulses there on both hearts. But I've heard Kerry interviewed a lot and she was an amazing woman and is an amazing woman. And she was somebody who obviously tethered him. So she offered him a foundation of support. She also said he was really hard to please sexually. He just constantly wanted sex. Now, this meant that by the early 80s, David, Bernie and Catherine had gone their separate ways. They're living separate married lives and to all intents and purposes, relatively happy. Now, David is married for six years and he has a daughter. However, things do start to go wrong. Up until this point, it's been okay. Even though he's got this insatiable sexual appetite, the actual relationship hasn't been violent. You know, he hasn't shown any real deviance at this moment in time, as far as his wife is concerned. Things do change shortly. But 
Then he has a really serious head injury at work and it cracks his skull right open. A container at a dredge shipping yard that he's working at basically hits him on the head. And his wife said, whilst it wasn't an instantaneous change, there was a very gradual unraveling. And when we think about psychopathy or when we look at activation impact, things that have changed as somebody is going through their life that can lead to certain outcomes, certainly head injuries figure, particularly frontal lobe damage. Add to that alcoholic mother, abandonment really, attachment issues and all of those problems, we are certainly putting him in a danger zone and he's already attempted to rape people and he also has a very long list of crimes that he's committed. So he's really high up now, isn't he? He's a serious offender and now he's had this head injury that is changing his personality as well. In fact, one of the marked changes was that he would start having affair after affair after affair. We're talking many women every single year. In fact, his wife finds out not only has he been having affairs, he's been advertising for sexual partners in the classified ads. So he's been saying that he wants to meet up with women for sex. So we're introduced to somebody who has an incredible insatiable appetite. Also, one of the things that she notices is he starts to really prod and poke her as a human being. So he's not being violent, but literally nothing she does is good enough. The way that she looks, the way that she cooks, the way that she cleans. So we see this controlling side of his nature growing after this head injury. But the piece de resistance, if ever there was going to be one, is that 10 years after they get married, he just turns up with a 16 year old girlfriend and moves her in. Just turns up. 16 year old girlfriend moves their daughter out of the daughter's bedroom into their bedroom and moves the girl into the daughter's bedroom. Because that's normal. That's what a well adjusted human does. And unsurprisingly, his wife goes, Yeah, that's not happening. And she leaves. But instantly, you can see, can't you? What is going on in his mind? I mean, that is not the mind of a rational human being, is it? I have loads of affairs, I advertise in the national papers for sex, and I'll just move in a barely legal girl to my daughter's bedroom. That's how to make a relationship work, isn't it, David? Now, as ever, it feels like fate intervenes horribly because he actually runs into Catherine again. And pretty much instantly, she realizes that she's still emotionally dependent on David. And within a really short period of time, she just walks out of her life. And I mean, she literally says to her husband with her six children, I'm just gonna go for a walk. And that was a long walk because it was one that she never came back from. It's like Forrest Gump, but not in a good place. So. She just abandons the entire family. What does that say about her? Because again, psychiatrists said that when she saw her child killed, it totally tripped her. But I think to myself, well, that would make me more protective of my children if it was an adjusted human being, no matter how horrible that experience had been, surely the response and reaction would be to be more protective of your children, not to meet up with an ex and be like, yeah, see you later and she just goes, that's it. The relationships are over. That relationship with the children is never corrected. She just chooses David straight over her kids. They move in together in a house on Morehouse Street. It's infamous now, Morehouse Street. And Kerry, who is the ex-wife now of David Burney, still obviously allows access with her daughter and she will go round often to have visits with him. And she says that they basically live in filth. So there is food everywhere. It's unkempt, much like the life that he led when he was a child. But what she also notices is that Catherine, who's now changed her name to Bernie, they're not actually married. She's just like, I'll just call myself Catherine Bernie, it's fine. 
didn't go through a formal process, don't need any of those things. After all, you can walk out on your kids, so why think about convention? And Kerry's take on Catherine Burney is that she's quite shy and reserved, but also she's quite cold. And that's unsurprising because Catherine Burney does not want any woman in her man's life. She's very, very obsessive. She wants David Burney for herself and only for herself. In fact, Kerry said no matter how many times she went with her daughter to drop her off, there was no warmth. It wasn't like a relationship then adjusted. Because we expect that, don't we? We expect that if we've got an ex and they meet a partner, it might be a bit awkward, first of all, but then over time, it would be a natural warming to that relationship, hopefully. That's what you do in a functional situation. But that never happens. She never warms to her. David Burney is working. He does work throughout. He's got a job at a car mechanics. But it's at this point he starts really getting involved in sadomasochistic fantasies. Now, I'm the first person to say BDSM is very, very popular. People have particular predilections for the type of sex they want. No judgment there. It's perfectly acceptable for you to have whatever fantasies you like between consenting adults or even in your own head. That's all right. But he starts to explore these fantasies with Catherine. So he starts broaching the subject and talking about it and they both get super excited about these particular sadomasochistic fantasies. So she is not somebody who's hard to get on board. She's somebody who's straight away engaging with these ideas. Now, his ex-wife said that one of the problems in their relationship was wherever she went, whatever she was doing, he was constantly pestering her for sex. So he has this, as I said, insatiable appetite, but it feels like it's not getting fulfilled. So now these really sadomasochistic fantasies start to become part of that pumping, of that feeling of what he sees as being sexually satisfied. And remember, let's track back to the fact that he's already nearly raped a woman. This is a situation where sex is main stage for David Burney. It also seems that David was constantly problematic where sex is concerned. As I've said, he was having sex with Catherine very early on in his teenage life, and his own brother, after these two are found to be serial killers, he goes on TV and he actually describes his brother as the kind of guy who just takes whatever he wants. And he gives this shocking revelation that his brother, even as a young man, needed sex every single night. And if he didn't get sex every single night, he was really frustrated. And when he couldn't get it, he actually went and asked his brother for sex. So his brother's in bed, obviously he's refused. And when he's going to sleep, as soon as David Burney realizes that he's asleep, he goes in, molests him and rapes him. His own brother. But if it couldn't get even more bizarre, it can. Because on his brother's 21st birthday, David Burney gives Catherine Burney as his present. He basically hadn't had sex at this point. So David Burney was like, happy birthday, brother. And Catherine Burney was presented to him and he had sex with her. Not the normal 21st birthday present that you'd think of. That brother, just nine years after he's interviewed about David on TV, he gets nine years in jail for raping an 80 year old woman and molesting a six year old girl. Just running through the blood, right? Running through the blood. Because even though he was obviously sexually molested, by his brother. The fact that he was willing to sleep with his partner and then goes on to horrifically rape and molest people, it just kind of tells you that there was something running through that blood, doesn't you? You know when we talk about is a serial killer formed or is a rapist born? I think we have to be honest and say that when we look at families, and families actually do have more than one particular sexual deviant, arguably, is there something within their DNA? Could there be some kind of predisposition? It's a question that will not get answered, but nonetheless, it makes me think. 
Now at this point, David and Catherine are constantly talking about their fantasies, but that's not enough. David, Bernie wants more. And they've got to fever pitch with their discussions. And what blows my mind is they start planning the perfect murder. They read a book on how to get away with the perfect murder and it becomes their Bible. They do their research for weeks and weeks and weeks. So this isn't just now sadomasochistic fantasy. This isn't role play with one another. This isn't BDSM where they're getting off with each other. This is starting to get excited about the idea of murdering somebody, but not just murdering somebody, murdering someone and getting away with it and reading a book on how to get away with the perfect murder. The first murder that occurs, it's Mary Nielsen. She's a student at university. She works at a deli part-time. She came from a really affluent area, a lovely young woman. She wants some cheap tires. And Catherine and David Burney have recognised that if they advertise for these tyres, there's a chance that someone will call. And when it's a woman, they'll be able to entice her there with the promise of these reduced price tyres. The second that Mary Nielsen crosses their doorway, she's grabbed, gagged straight away, chained to a bed. They have all the equipment ready. David rapes her constantly. But let me tell you, whilst Catherine is watching, she's not just watching it, she's coaxing him, she's playing with his genitals as well, she's getting involved. She really enjoys watching that sadomasochism. She enjoys seeing it play out. Now, as I've told you, one of the things that they've done is they've read a book on the perfect murder. So he takes her car and he drives it and dumps it outside the police station because he believes that that is the last place that the police are gonna look when they're looking for a missing person. And then he returns there again, rapes her again and again. So this book, Perfect Murder, and you can probably buy a copy, not that I'm suggesting you should, because obviously some people use it for the wrong kind of purposes, but this Perfect Murder, they use it as a blueprint literally as a blueprint. After he's had his way with her for a couple of days, she's then driven to a national park. He rapes her again and then he strangles her and stabs her through the heart. They bury her there and even though she's missing and she has family who are instantly worried because she doesn't go missing, they initially say it's missing person, but pretty quickly the police realise that it's a suspected homicide. They haven't got a body, but it just doesn't make sense. Now two weeks, just two weeks, just two weeks after the first murder, Susanna Candy is kidnapped. Now this is where they up the ante. She is basically a hitchhiker. It was really common back at this time to hitchhike. In fact, I remember driving around Australia and New Zealand when I was traveling and I picked hitchhikers up all the time. It was just part of the culture. So essentially it's not unusual for a young girl wanting to get a lift home. And of course, just like Myra Hindley used to do, because Catherine Burney is in the car and she leans out and asks whether she can help, it just automatically makes people think that they can trust. I don't know why, I don't know what that is about when a woman is there with a guy, but for some reason, because we don't expect women to be the kind of people that they can turn out to be, it lulls you into a false sense of security. So Susanna Candy is kidnapped, placed in the car, has a knife put to her throat, obviously is subdued by that. And what is terrifying is that Catherine and David Burney don't always kill their victims. They pick them up, but there is a point where Catherine will make a decision. Catherine will decide whether the person is the right shape, size, the right fit for what she wants to fantasize about. And the way that she lets David Burney know is she says, 
I've got the munchies. That's the code. The minute that she says, I've got the munchies, they get the knife out. They say that if they scream, they'll kill them. They get them back to the home. And with Susanna Candy, again, they gag her, chain her to a bed, rape her. But they also make her write letters to her family to say that she's gone to see friends. The next day, after being raped and tortured all night, they make her make a phone call to tell her family that she's going away. Imagine what that girl would be going through. Because her best hope is that she's gonna be a victim of kidnap and gonna be raped constantly for a period of time. But I imagine in the back of her mind, she's thinking to herself, they're giving themselves some space. They're creating a situation where I am not going to be looked for. I think at that moment she probably knew that she was going to die. And the way that they try to kill her is they try to strangle her. But wow, she fights. She fights hard, really hard. So they force sleeping tablets down her throat. And then once she's unconscious, they finish off strangling her. And Catherine is really involved. Don't think for one minute that this is David Burney leading. Catherine Burney likes the kill. She really likes the kill. They then drive to Glen Eagle National Park and they bury her. 10 days after this crime, 10 days. So just think about this. This is 10 days after the last killing, they pick up Nolene Patterson. She's 31. So a little bit older than their current MO. Again, with her, her car is broken down. She's having some problems with it. And they basically offer to take her home. They gag her, they chain her. But the thing is this time, David is really attracted to her. He's really attracted to this particular victim. And Naleen gets this. She recognises that he's feeling physically very connected to her and she's clever. Remember, she's 31. She's not a child. You know, we do learn to manipulate better as we get older. And she's very attractive. She was an air hostess. She was very glamorous. She was one of those people who had class. Whereas Catherine, we know that she was very ordinary looking. She was very scruffy. There was very little elegance about her. But Nalene's beautiful. She's elegant. She's got lots of class. And when they've actually picked her up, Catherine Burney is thinking that obviously she's just going to be another throwaway pleasure. She doesn't want David Burney to actually want to be with this woman. She just wants him to torture her and kill her. It's as simple as that. Now, the moment that Catherine Burney notices that David wants more, because she walks in and what's happening is that they're cuddling each other. So Nalene's being really bright. They're cuddling one another. And the consequence of that is it actually incenses Catherine. Again, because she's trying as a victim to placate the two, she agrees to make a phone call to her family to say she's not in trouble. And she rang her friend and told her where her car was and so on. So she's really trying to make this situation possible where she can get them on side, which is a clever thing to do because often these kind of people who kill this way, they're quite delusional and they have particular beliefs about their own grandeur. So the choices are, I either fight and die potentially in the situation or I coerce and manipulate them into believing that I'm actually completely on side and that I'm not somebody that is a victim, I'm more a lover because that makes it more difficult for the person to then be murdered. She's kept captive for two days, having to play this role, having to act like she's into David Burney, this hideous human being who's just doing the most awful things to her. But Catherine Burney cannot stand it. And a couple of days into this, they have the biggest argument. She storms out of the house, and when she returns, she basically has 
an ultimatum. She comes in with a knife and she says to David, I'm going to kill myself unless you choose me. Choose me or her, but just know if you choose her, I'm going to kill myself right now. Obviously, he's left with that impossible choice, isn't he? He may well have wanted to keep Nalene alive. He may well have felt that she was enough to satiate his desire, but Catherine cannot handle that. So, he chooses her. He chooses Catherine Burney. And the way that they kill her is they force sleeping pills down her throat. And then Catherine strangles her. She takes great pleasure in this. Great pleasure. In fact, when they go and bury her, even though David and Catherine Burney have had this huge argument about it, he won't bury her near the other girls. He says that Nalene deserves better. So he even leaves her underwear on when he buries her and he buries her separately to where the other girls and victims are. Catherine Burney, however, feels very differently. And as they start to bury her, she throws sand in her face, the ultimate disrespect. You know, she's angry that David Burney is attracted to this woman. She is angry that it's got to this point and she's glad that Nalene is dead. She's glad. Four days after this has happened. So think about this timeline, guys. Think about how quickly this is escalating. We are going through a killing spree. Four days after they've just murdered Nalene, they're back at it again. They pick up Denise Brown. She's taken prisoner. She's one of those people that lives quite routine. She's a computer analyst. So she has quite a rhythm and routine to her life. She lives with a boyfriend. And again, she's hitchhiking. And when they get her back to go through the same motions that they always do, one of the things that now happens is that Catherine starts to take notes of what jewelry she's wearing, what clothes she's wearing. She makes a meticulous list of these items. Now, whether she's doing that because she just wants to have more power and control and she likes the idea of making the victim feel even more terrified, because it would be terrifying, wouldn't it? Why are you taking notes on what I'm wearing and what my jewelry is? Was it because she wanted to make sure that she could get rid of the evidence after they were dead? You know, why is she making that choice? After this list has been made, he rapes her. The same MO, the next morning, She's forced to ring a friend to say that she's okay. She's going to be away for a few days. But instantly, the police know that this is out of character for Denise Brown. And the problem at this point with policing is it wasn't and isn't unusual for people to go missing for a period of time. Particularly if that person's made a phone call to say that they are, by their own volition, going to visit friends. But for her boyfriend and her friends, this was completely out of character. So it does start to cause interest that there are these women who seem to, in a relatively short amount of time, be telling the same story and then disappearing. Again, they rape her and drug her and then they take her to a forest at Wanneroo. As with all the other scenarios, David Burney rapes her, but this time he cuts her throat. And then, as he begins to bury her, she sits up and starts screaming. So she knows that she's had her throat cut, that she's being buried alive. Imagine those moments, those last moments. David just goes to the car, gets out an ax, and hits her in the head twice with it. Just without even a thought, without any conscience, without any care. Imagine that death. I mean, murder is horrific. In your last moments, to have your life taken in such a horrific way, oh, it just gives you chills, doesn't it? But imagine having your throat cut, being buried alive, and then realizing what's happening and being hysterical and getting somebody hit you in the head with an ax twice. But this is the point where the police start linking the crimes. This is when they start thinking, wow, these girls are going missing at a pace. Even though we understand 
that lots of people do go missing and then come home, there is something that smells off about this particular case. Now, this, for me, is one of the most stunning escapes I have ever witnessed. Because we're talking about their next victim. Their next victim is 17 years old. I want you to think back to when you were 17. Imagine being picked up by a couple that you think you're going to be safe with and you're taken back to the place where you're going to be raped and murdered. So imagine what's going on in your mind. Five days after Denise's murder, five days, right? This is how quick these murders are going on. A 17-year-old Kate Moore staggers half naked into a Fremantle supermarket screaming that she's been abducted and she's been raped. The police pick her up and she tells the police that she was picked up off the Stirling Highway hitchhiking. She says that she was stripped, that she was raped. This girl believed that she'd be murdered. She absolutely believed that she was going to die. So she starts to leave clues around the house so that when they find them, they'll link the murder of herself to that situation, to that couple. And she's clever. Because when David's going to work, she recognises that Catherine is one of those human beings who craves some kind of contact, so she starts trying to befriend her. And she manages to get Catherine to untie her, and now she's free from her shackles. She's also fed. So she, this is a 17-year-old girl who's been kidnapped off the street, who's been raped repeatedly and tortured, and she has the wherewithal not only to convince Catherine Burney, who is an absolute killer, that she's on her side, she's actually trying to befriend her in a way that she's manipulating the situation to her advantage. She's 17. And whenever Catherine Burney isn't looking, at every possible moment, she's planting notes and personal items all around the house. She even leaves a driving license of a friend of hers down the side of a couch because she wants to make damn sure that if she's gonna die, if she's gonna be murdered, then her legacy will be that they find who killed her. The next day, David goes to work, leaving Kate and Catherine Burney at the home. And again, she just leaves this trail of personal information. She writes notes, she does everything and anything she can to ensure that they will find the fact that she's been killed. And while she's intentionally become friendly with Catherine, she obviously knows that her time is limited. And then a moment happens. Divine intervention, sliding doors, whatever you want to call it. Because there's a knock at the door. Because Catherine Burney and David Burney do drugs. So a drug dealer has come to drop off the drugs. Now, Catherine hides Katie in a bedroom, but the second that she hears her go to that front door, she finds an unlocked window and she runs like hell and she runs naked down the street into a shop nearby and they call the police. Now, the police at this moment in time do not know what they're dealing with. There's this girl who's naked, distressed, hysterical, and initially they're a little bit perturbed because she could possibly be under the influence. They don't actually know what's been happening. They're not necessarily pinning the crimes together at this moment in time. But then she offers to lead the detective to the house. And the minute that they get near it, she becomes absolutely hysterical. And one of the detectives said it was in that moment that he absolutely knew without doubt that everything that she was saying was true because the violence of her reaction, the trauma that she went through when she pointed out the house, the horror, the fear, it just became so present. And when they go to the house, amazingly, no one's there. So Catherine and David Burney are out and the doors open. And as soon as they go in, they just go and look for the traces that Kate's left and they find them. She tells the police she's been chained up. She even identified the fact that there were specific numbers on the locks. She said that they also tried to drug her. The police found the sleeping tablet that she spat out. Now, obviously, the police are going to stake out the house and wait for them to come back. And the first person back 
is Catherine Burney and she struggles. You know, she fights when they're trying to arrest her and she basically denies all charges, says that she doesn't have a clue what they're talking about. And then obviously they go and arrest David Burney. The neighborhood was completely stunned. None of them could believe that in this kind of leafy suburb, that there were literally serial killers next door. No one had noticed. And they were asking themselves for years, how could these women, these teenagers have been murdered so violently without us noticing them? How did they get the bodies out? You know, how did they manage that? But that's the thing. You don't imagine, do you, in life, that the person living next door to you would be like that. And because you don't have that expectation, then when you hear things going on at night, you don't think probably murdering someone. You just think to yourself that they're just doing what they do. And that's why so many people get away with crimes because very often human beings see the best in people, not the worst in people. They're both really uncooperative when they get to the police station. The detectives are trying to interview them. They're resistant. They're not cooperating at all. But as it gets later on in the night, one of the detectives says in a completely throwaway comment, it's getting dark, let's get a shovel and dig them up. And David responds, okay, there's four of them. And at that point he admits it all. Catherine at this point has been resistant. She hasn't accepted any charges. As far as she's concerned, she's innocent. But then the police come in with irrefutable evidence. And so she does agree to go with them to point out the graves. And it's really unnerving seeing these pictures, isn't it? Seeing them literally pointing out the graves of these poor girls. But what probably provokes the most visceral reaction for me is that Catherine didn't only direct them to the graves, she was really proud of it. And when she came to Nalene's grave, the woman that David Burney liked, she spat on it. How does that even compute? She spat on the victim's grave and she's proud of her work. And when it goes to court, with respect, they both plead guilty, which to some degree at least prevents families having to be in the witness to the testimony that's given. I do think that that at least is something that they spared, but they obviously get into court because they have to be found guilty nonetheless. There has to be a case. And they physically put their hands on her to kind of motion her in. And a journalist who's watching says she literally went off like a wild cat screaming, biting, scratching, swearing, literally uncontrollable. And all through the hearing, she has complete indifference. She shows no emotion. In fact, the only thing that she cares about is the devotion that she has to David. And that's it. They're both sentenced to life with no release, which makes absolute sense. Because when you think about the gravity of the crime, the torture, the enjoyment, and believe me, I think that they are equal in their psychopathy. I think they're equal in their enjoyment of killing. I don't think it's a case of, oh, I was under pressure as a woman to do the bidding of my partner. You know, as far as I'm concerned, she thrived on it. And look at how quick the killings were becoming. In 2005, nearly 20 years after David Burney went to prison, he hangs himself in jail. Couldn't do the time. A lot of people can't do the time. And he knew that he was never gonna get out. There's no way he wouldn't have been fully aware that no court of appeal would ever let him walk free. So he chooses to exit himself. I can't say that I'd be somebody who'd cry over that. In fact, I think it's probably saved quite a lot of money, him not being somebody who the state have to look after. And when you think about what he did to his victims, 20 years being looked after is more than they were ever afforded. And let me tell you, the police think that there were many, many more deaths. They think that Catherine knows there were many, many more deaths. Not necessarily with Catherine, 
But as far as they're concerned, they believe that David Burney killed many more. And Catherine actually knows that because remember, he shared his fantasies with her. So the likelihood is that she has that power. Now, Catherine Burney is still alive and you'll be glad to know that she currently runs the prison library. Yeah, she's got a nice little job as a librarian. And I watched an interview with a woman called Ruth, who was the community education manager. And she got to know her quite well. And the way that she described Catherine Burney was, when she speaks, she's quite childlike. She's quite willing to please. She's got a very childish voice. But on one occasion, this particular community education manager took issue with the way that Catherine Burney was acting. And she basically said, don't pull that shit on me. And she said, within a second, Catherine Burney grabbed her by the throat. She said that she was glowing with rage. I think it's really important to think about that word, glowing. So not full of rage, but glowing, enjoying it. And she turned to Ruth and she said, you don't know power until you've held someone's life in your hands. I mean, I think we can all agree, she sounds like the perfect librarian. I mean, you do need to manage people in libraries. Often, they speak too loudly. Essentially, she's the perfect kind of person. Not terrifying at all. Obviously, in that second, Ruth said, she saw her become a murderer. She knew that this woman was an absolute danger. Then, she found out that she just had a few pen pals. I mean, I understand, don't get me wrong. I think it's really important. Writing to prisoners is really healthy for a lot of people because they've had terrible lives, some of them, and having pen pals is helpful. So that was something that lots of people have the option to do in prison. But she was writing to Myra Hindley and Eileen Wernos. I do wonder whether Rose West would have been very upset about not being involved in that particular trio. But she really liked being in the infamous Killers Club. And one of the things that she took credit for while she was in prison, one night she heard a woman in the cell next door trying to hang herself, so she alerts the guards. But the reason that she alerts the guards is she says that only she's the person that could have helped because only she recognises the sound of gurgling when somebody is dying. What a hero, you know? See how distorted she is. See how much she enjoys the killing. I think that she probably enjoyed the killing more than David Burney enjoyed the killing. Certainly she enjoyed strangulation and that in itself is an incredibly intimate way to kill somebody. And you have to see the life literally drip from their eyes. Now in 2010, Catherine bid for parole. Of course she did, because she's a complete narcissist who thinks that she should be allowed to walk the streets in spite of the fact of just murdering lots of people and loving killing. She just thinks probably gonna take a job at the community library, I don't know, but it was refused. I have no sympathy for that whatsoever. I'm glad it's been refused. I hope she will never be released because when it comes down to it, Catherine Burney is, as far as I'm concerned, bad to the core. If you were to split her in half, I just think it would be evil running from her veins. And I'm telling you now, I'm the first person to understand that people are also created. They did not have easy lives. David and Catherine Burney were unfortunate in the way that they were raised. They were unfortunate human beings. But there is never an excuse to brutalize, torture, destroy, and enjoy the destruction of other human life. I'm glad that she will never, ever take a breath of fresh air that isn't behind a very high wall. I hope that you've found this particular case interesting. I hadn't been aware of it until you suggested it. So please do suggest other cases. This for me blows my mind because I think about that 17 year old girl and how her absolute wherewithal in that moment, just that adrenaline thinking, how do I make sure, how do I figure a way forward that my legacy will be that they will discover these people murdered me? And thank God she escaped. 
And thank God she had the understanding of where she was and the fact that she could take them there. Because without that happening, they really had planned the perfect murders and they were getting away with them. And maybe they'd have continued to get away with them. Whatever happens, it just shows you, doesn't it? That clarity of thinking is something that really can save you. Being able to just kind of step outside of the panic and step into strategy, it can really change your life. And for Kate, that's exactly what happened. Join me next time when I release my next true crime and let me know if you've liked it. And if you haven't subscribed yet, why? Subscribe immediately. Thank you. See you soon.